Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for allowing me to come today to talk to you about 9-11. Today, we come together to honor Americans, to reaffirm our commitment to this great country, and to discuss a way of life that we are all so very privileged to live. I want to share with you some of our experiences to tell you what we have done and more importantly, what we have gained in our volunteer service. For many years, we have been National Disaster Relief Volunteers for the American Red Cross. These 32 disaster experiences have taken us all over the United States. Until September the 11th, we all took the basic necessities for granted. Food, shelter, a warm place to live, water, and most of all, security. HS and I arrived at the Greater New York City American Red Cross chapter on September the 13th. Our first route was West and Chambers Street. One day spent at the Emergency Operations Center. The day Wall Street reopened, we handed out thousands of mental health flyers at the Staten Island Ferry Terminal. We were assigned to kitchen number two at West and Washington Street as soon as it opened in Lower Manhattan. From the first moment, we were speechless, astounded. Television was so complete but was totally inadequate. The arid smell and the thick smoke, the eerie lights at night surrounded by huge blackened out buildings, smoke and fire were still pouring from the debris pile. The debris pile was 10 stories high and covered 16 acres. The dust covered <laughs> us and everything else in the city. Each night, we went back to our hotel covered with grit. From kitchen number two, we looked right over West Highway to see the Statue of Liberty and the World Trade Center site. We arrived at the kitchen every morning at 4.30. Huge steel beams were buried into the pavement of West Highway. The force of the crumbling towers was so strong that a beam from the 85th floor of tower number one was thrown 400 yards due east into the American Express building. This beam weighed 46,000 pounds. Besides the towers, 27 other buildings were destroyed. Everywhere we went, every day, there were cars and trucks and all kinds of emergency vehicles from all over the United States with red and blue and yellow lights flashing. At the kitchen, we could watch the motorcades leave the World Trade Center site and travel slowly down West Highway. Four police motorcycles, followed by one ambulance, every time a body was found. And Jeff and I did get a day off. I had never been to New York. We took our laundry to the Wash Dry and Fold. We headed towards Rockefeller Center. We saw where they escaped in the wintertime, where the National Christmas Tree stands. We checked out NBC Studio. We walked one more block to go through the famous St. Patrick's Cathedral, and we were cut to the core by what we saw. First, a band of bagpipes marched down Fifth Avenue playing their sad song. Then came all kinds of fire trucks and emergency vehicles. They lined all four corners of the intersection. What's going on? And then there it was, a huge ladder truck, and perched on top was one of New York's signs. On top of the flag draped casket, the remains of the skeleton. His garden by two of his fellow firefighters. 
as they gently tapped him on his last row. He is followed by hundreds of firefighters, law enforcement officers from all over the United States. We both fell apart in the middle of the street. And I saw that the injustice, fire trucks passed in review with huge American flags flying as they all stood in honor of their lost comrade. 2,800 people gone in the blink of an eye. Our next route was the respite center at Ground Zero. We loaded catered meals, drove for two or three blocks to Ground Zero, dropped our hot meals, four security checks on the way in, and one on the way out, along with power washing the truck every time we left Ground Zero. New hot meals for the workers every other hour, 24 hours a day. Ground Zero, how amazing. The finger-shaped piece of steel that you kept seeing on television was 27 stories tall and weighed 8,000 tons. It was the hottest fire in the history of the United States, and it melted the souls from the workmen's boots. The New York Fire Department was in charge of the search for bodies, and when a fireman's body was found, they contacted his fire station and allowed his co-workers to come to the site and carry his flag-draped body out of the hell of the debris pile and into the arms of America. Next, we agreed for authorities to do a background check. The next day, we were given the opportunity to transfer to the Staten Island landfill. This is where all of the debris was taken, and it was more secure than ground zero. It was a crime scene. 500 detectives, FBI, FBI, firemen, and many undercover officers and others separated the huge steel beams into a separate pile to be recycled. They rode through the dust and sifted the dirt over and over, collecting any small particles possible, searching for evidence and looking for answers. 500 people did this 24 hours a day for nine months. At the landfill, the debris was searched down to one quarter of an inch. Keep in mind that there was no glass, for the force was so tremendous that these two glass buildings returned to sand. There were no pieces of desk or computer, no pieces of sheetrock. Almost nothing was left but gray dust and steel. Stacks of cars and trucks, police cars, EMS vehicles, fire trucks, <coughs> FedEx trucks, UPS trucks that were destroyed in the blast lines stacked five or six vehicles high, stretching almost as far as you can see on one side of the landfill. The American Red Cross served hot meals three times a day with sandwich meals, snacks, drinks, coffee, bottled water, all served by smile on faces 24-7. Our kitchen was a donated double wine set up like a cafeteria with steam tables. And another connecting building that was set up like a dining room with tables and chairs and snacks and a big screen TV. The American Red Cross served a total of 14 million meals while in New York City. 